Before I begin, the source I used is Shihab al-Saraf's chapter, Close Combat Weapons in the Early Abbasid Period, Maces, Axes and Swords. In the work, Companion to Medieval Arms and Armour, edited by David Nicole. The majority of information in this video is either paraphrased or quoted verbatim from this book, and I'd highly recommend this work. In the popular imagination, the Dane Axe, a two-handed axe with a broad blade, is a weapon that has been romanticised. What many people don't know is that such a design was evident in the medieval Islamic world as well, spanning the same period and lasting throughout the medieval period into the early modern. The Tabar the Persian word for axe, which developed as the underlining term, came to be used as a midway point between heavy and light maces, but how did such a weapon develop the role it would take? For the purpose of historical context, we need to understand the role of different maces in the medieval Islamic world. From Shihab al-Saraf's work, we get a good historical overview of the mace in the medieval Islamic world. In the Abbasid period, two distinct types of maces were used. The lighter dabus, consisting of a wooden or iron haft with a head of iron or other solid materials. The other was the amud, a one-piece iron staff. There were also the terms jurts and lat, which are occasionally mentioned and it's possible these represented two intermediate styles. The amud, literally meaning pole, column or staff, was a thick iron baton, usually without a separate head, or one integral to the handle. Its design and the fact it was made out of iron made it much heavier than the dabus. The longest one we have a record of was called Al Mustaufi and it measures two cubits, which is about 100 centimeters in Iraqi measure or 108.8 centimeters in Egyptian measure. In his account of the Fatimid New Year procession during the first half of the 12th century, Ibn al Tuwayr who lived from 1130 to 1220, described the Mustafiyat as square sectioned iron staves with round handles and were carried by a select number of Sibyan al-Rikab who escorted the Fatimid sovereign. Many cases testify to the deadliness of the Amud as a weapon due to its weight. Indeed sources testify to one mighty blow that would prove fatal, however compared to the lighter doubles it could not be wielded as easily. According to Shihab al-Sarab, the Amud bearer often put all of his weight into one decisive blow and made sure his blow did not miss, otherwise he himself would be thrown seriously off balance. Al-Jahiz mentioned a Qardawai al-Asar who, having lost his arm, trained himself to fight with his left hand, choosing the Amud so he could defeat the enemy with one blow. According to Ibrahim al-Sindi, the first half of the 9th century, Muhammad ibn Khalid, an Abbasid army commander and author of a lost work on arms and armour, prostrated a war horse and toppled its rider when his arm would miss the enemy's head but hit the pommel of his saddle. Al-Tabari testifies that in 698, the Kharajid leader Shibib ibn Yazid 696, entered Kufa with his followers going to the palace of the governor and furiously striking its huge gate with his armud, causing so much damage that the people of Kufa went to see it afterwards. The armud of Shibib, which he killed Muhammad ibn Musa ibn Talha with, was done in a single blow that smashed both the helmet and the head. It weighed 12 Syrian rattles, approximately 22.2 kilograms. In this last encounter with the army of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, the Umayyad governor of Iraq, 714, Shibib killed someone who he thought to be Khalid ibn Atab, the commander of the Umayyad right wing. He was said to use an armoured weighing 15 unspecified rattles. If in Syrian rattles, this would mean 27.750 kg. The armoured of Al Kharith ibn Surayj, 745, a dissident Umayyad army commander in Khurasan who waged war against the Transoxanians and Turks was said to be heavier, weighing around 18 Syrian rattles or 33.3 kg. More realistic weights are given in Kitab al-Shamil by Abd al-Rahman al-Tabari in the first half of the 9th century. He stated that Ahmed al-Surmath, 
a great archer and prominent member of the Khorasani Corps of the Abbasid army in the early 9th century, used an armoured of 24 Iraqi ratul, about 10 kg, but when he became an old man, he used one weighing only 16 Iraqi ratul, 6.5 kg. Al-Saraf assumes that 10 kg was reasonable as a maximum weight, the minimum weight being 4 or 5 kg and the medium being 7 kg. There's little evidence to suggest that the weapon was used in the Arab conquests, however we know it was carried in Sassanid Persia, the term for it being Lacht, and according to Al-Tabari, it was optional for the Sassanid cavalrymen between it and the Tarbazin or war axe. Carrying this while attending the ruler was also evident in Sassanid palace ceremonies. The earliest reference to its use in the Islamic world was during Khalif Ali ibn Abi Talib 656-661. al Dinawari, followed by al Masudi, 957 makes a passing remark of its use at the Battle of Sifin where in 657 both sides were heavily armoured. However, this is not corroborated by other sources of the battle. In the Umayyad period, Ziyad ibn Abi 673 created a unit of special escort guards which carried armuds and javelins. However, it never became a standard item in this time. Its use picked up in the Abbasid period. An Abbasid Furusiyah manual states the armud as the most important weapon in war in all times and situations. It is among weapons like a lying among animals, and all people acknowledge its virtue and prefer it to other weapons because no other arm can replace it. The author, who is anonymous, confirmed however that the use of an arm wood needs a combination of great physical strength, sturdiness, dexterity and agility. He also insisted that the arm wood bearer must be stronger than his arm wood so as to enable him to perfect the use of the weapon. Such a weapon seems to be the privilege of the elites due to the material required to make it. References to this weapon are for the caliphs, army commanders, high ranking officers, notable Daria, caliphal palace gilmans, the cream of the Shakariya troops and privileged gilman divisions such as Hujariya and al Sajia. Such was provided by the caliphs arsenal to the Shakariya and gilman and or masters of such troops. So why did such a weapon begin to disappear from the 9th century? It's important to emphasize the manufacturing use of such a weapon only survived as long as a wide-spanning empire, like the Abbasid Caliphate. The decline of the empire and its trade network brought an end to the armwood as a viable weapon. After this, the word is used rather anachronistically, the term either made as an ambiguous comparison or taken from earlier sources. By the 10th century, the word becomes scarce and had disappeared by the end of the century. Al Tasusi, who wrote a treatise to Saladin in the 12th century, merely describes it as being made of iron and far more effective than the Dabus. In comparison, the Dabus stood as a lighter option. Indeed, one armoured of minimum weight could create two heavy swords, or two daggers, or seven Dabus heads, making the Dabus far more economical. The term itself is conjecture and may have entered Persian from Arabic in the 8th century. The design is a round-headed mace, consisting of a baton with a head made of bitumen and was known in Abbasid Iraq as Asa Mukhayara or Al Mukhayara from Kir meaning bitumen. It was also known as Mukya, which was corrupted to the modern Iraqi Arabic vernacular word Mukwar. However, the term Dabus emerged under the Abbasids in the second half of the 8th century with no evidence of its use in pre-Islamic, early Islamic or Umayyad periods. The early Abbasid Dabus was a specific type of mace, being light with a round or oval head, the former being called Dabus Mudawar, which was the most common. Al-Tabari drew a distinction between the Amud, the Dabus and the Jurts, the latter meaning a knob mace entirely made out of iron, alluding to its Sassanid origin of Gurts. Though the term jurt had come to mean something hard, solid, strong and thick. Later Furusiyah treatises drawing upon earlier Basid sources equated the Persian gurt with the toothed lat, meaning heavy mace, saying that at the time of Kuzro Anu Shurwan 731-579, the Persians had 10,000 Pakhlawan 
Heroes Brandishing Tooth Lights One of the earliest references to Adabus is in a statement attributed to the Abbasid Sukhdian commander Al Afshin, 841 from modern Uzbekistan, who was accused of denigrating the Arabs by saying that they could be dealt with easily by the use of the Dabus. Al Jahiz was among the foremost of authors who reported this remark in his work Kitab al Asa, which forms part of his Al Bayan wal i Tabin. He compares it to the wooden baton with the knobbed head, which was carried by the people of Medina. The fact he needed to explain the word, unusual in his writings, indicated the word specifying a particular mace was not widely known or used in the Abbasid army. Most references to the Dabuls from the 9th century onwards are associated with Gilman troops. The foundation of the institution by Caliph al Mutasim (833-42) coincided with the appearance of the term. Under al Mutadid (892-902), the Dabuls' use was prominent being worn in belts in both peacetime and in war, military expeditions or daily life, mounted or dismounted. There is some evidence to show that the common dabus was light, with no accounts existing of anyone dying to the weapon. In fact, multiple accounts exist where a person is attacked by a number of dabus bearers and emerge without fatal injuries. Its role in the earlier periods was minor, becoming heavier in the later periods, its role less important than the Amud and the Tarbazin war axe. As mentioned, the round-headed Dabus is the most common, the name of the head being Khirza, literally meaning bead. The head could be plain, toothed, spiked or flanged. The term round also implies that other forms were used, such as the cucumber-like head. In the later centuries, especially during the Mamluk period, the oval and cucumber shaped forms were common and the generic term for the head of a dabus became khiarat, literally meaning cucumber al dabus. The 10th century provides a divergence point in the evolution of the dabus when the term lat appears. The word derives from the Arab verb lata, meaning the act of smashing or pounding. Ibn al Tuwayr describes it as a mace with a head of elongated teeth mounted on an iron or wooden half covered with red or black shagreen. He distinguishes it from the dabus on the basis that the latter had a round head rather than an elongated toothed head. However, this is misleading as the dabus could have a variety of different forms yet still be called a dabus. The real difference laid in the weight and size of the heads, the heads of the lat being bigger and much heavier. In fact, it's safe to say that the lat may be defined as an oversized and heavy dabus, representing an Abbasid development and was perhaps originally conceived as a medium weight type between the light dabus and the heavy armud. In the second half of the 10th century, the lat completely replaces the armud, emerging a mace which was more widely used, less costly and easier to handle. Such a weapon became primary in close combat and were especially used by Turkish Gilman. Like the Armud, such a weapon could be excessively heavy and it may be at this point that the Lad and Dabus started to be carried attached to the saddle. In the 11th century, the line between Lad and Dabus becomes blurred and both terms are used synonymously. This may imply that Dabus's were getting heavier and that the term was synonymous with studded maces, irrespective of their weight and the forms of their head. This is confirmed in the 12th century when the term Lad steadily fell into decline. The predominance of the word in this century is illustrated by the decision of Saif al-Din Ghazi ibn Ataqbik Imad al-Din Zanki of Mosul 1149 who ordered his army to carry a dabus attached to their saddles in all circumstances and not only during military expeditions as has been customary. According to Ibn Arthir, this ordinance became an established rule as other Muslim rulers followed the example of Saif al-Din. Artasusi makes no distinction between Lat, which only nominally figures in the title, and the Dabus, to which he devoted the bulk of his argument. In another contemporary work to Saladin, the Al Fatah al Kuzi by Imad al Din al Isfahani, 1201, we find several references to the Lat, however, these were indicated by the rhyming style of the prose and all occur as synonyms of the Dabus, especially one made entirely of iron, the Dabus Hadid. 
This was also the term which referred to Saladin's mace, which was sent with his arms and armour to the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad after his death. By the beginning of the 13th century, the word Lat became extremely scarce in the written sources, and when it does arise, it's attached to the word Hadid, as in Lat Hadid, which is to be understood as Dabuz Hadid. In this context, the author of Zubdad al Tawarikh, Sadd al Din al Husseini, after 1225, used the term Makma Ato, designating an extraordinarily heavy iron Dabuz weighing 41 kilograms. This is the first and only time this term is used, which is the pure Arabic equivalent of the term Dabuz. This shows the term Lat had at this point completely fallen out of use and Dabuz had become a sole generic term for a mace. Probably in the second half of the 12th century or the first half of the 13th century, in the context of Mamluk training, the rules for the art of fighting with the Dabuz are standardised in a recognised number of exercises called bands. 35 of these bands were later recorded by Mamluks of Egypt and Syria, becoming the primary close combat weapon for a Mamluk Faris or fully trained cavalryman. So where does the axe, the tabar, fall into this? To understand the tabar, it's first important to understand its development as a midway point between the Abbasid heavy Amud and the light Dabuz. This is indicated by the suggestion that Abbasid tabars were rather heavy and large blades. Previous opinion states the term Tarvazin represented a light, short-hafted, small-bladed cavalry war axe similar to those carried by Safavid cavalrymen later on, the term Tarbazin being defined as saddle axe, however this is not true. The term Tarbazin and Tabar did not denote specific types of war axes, but were generally used for a war axe in general. In the Sasanid and medieval period, the term Tarbazin represents a genuine word for war axe until the end of the 10th century. At the end of the 11th or beginning of the 12th century, the term tabar, simply meaning axe, assumed the meaning of war axe and predominated from the second half of the 12th century onwards. The Sasanid Tarvazin is strongly suggested to be a massive broad blade with a rather long half. Carrying this and an arm wood would be cumbersome and difficult and both could do the same job. This implies the blade would have needed to be large and heavy to have the same effect. In the story of Bagram Gur and the two lions, in order to regain the kingdom of his father, Bagram chose the Tarbazin as his only weapon when he decided to face and kill single-handedly and on foot the two starving lions which guarded the royal crown. This implies that not only was the weapon used, dismounted, but was also not short-hafted. The first mention of the word Tarbazin in Arabic sources occurs in a poem by the famous Umayyad Bedouin poet Jarir, 728, the context of the axe being used as an instrument of punishment. The poet was reminding a person named Mujib, who was accused of theft and had been released for lack of evidence, that his right hand narrowly escaped getting chopped off by a Tarbazin, which, being so powerful, could have dismembered a whole body. This evidence points to the fact that the first occurrence shows the Tarbazin had a broad heavy blade with a double-handed shaft. These characteristics, similar to their Sassanid counterpart, must have been available in Iraq where Jarir spent the greater part of his life as a poet. We have no evidence of conventional Arab cavalry ever using it in the 7th century or even later. With little of it mentioned in the Umayyad Caliphate in the 9th century Abbasid sources only referencing its use in Khurasan, however none of it concerns the Arab Caliphal army. Its use by Khurasanis is evidence from the birth of the Abbasid state and were only fully introduced to Abbasid cavalry after the advent of Caliph al-Mamun with his new, mostly Persian though largely Arabicized, Khurasanian troops who took pride in their use of this weapon, as reported by al-Jahiz. The Tarbazin also became a common and favourite weapon of Gilman troops from the very inception of the institution in the 9th century, up to the beginning of the second half of the 10th century. This period of 150 years represented the apogee of the war axe as a major close combat cavalry weapon in medieval Islamic history. The types of Tarbazin used during the early Abbasid period is lacking in direct evidence, 
Nevertheless, there are hints at the quarter moon, half moon, double bladed, and perhaps also the bearded types of blades were all known. It's also difficult to pinpoint a dominant type given the wide range of possible sources of supply within the context of the flourishing 9th century international arms trade. For example, one such supply centre was Armenia, from which came, according to Al Mazudi, Tarbazins called Siwardia. This name is the plural of Al Siwardi, which is derived from Dervodik, the name of an Armenian tribe. But most likely an important number of war axes, especially for elite troops, were made locally in caliphal arsenal workshops. The Abbasids were the first Islamic dynasty to be attended by Tarbazin bearers as part of their ceremonial function in the palace. During official audiences, the caliph was surrounded by a number of both Tarbazin bearers and mace bearers, carefully selected from among the Dariya and Baraniya, palace and non-palace Gilman and private servants. The practice had been established since at least the 9th century and it continued during the first decades of the Buwayhid domination when the caliphs lost their temporal power. When in 977, according to Hilal al-Sabi, when the caliph al tayi received the Buwayhid Adud al dola the throne was surrounded by hundreds of his private servants in beautiful attire with coloured garments wearing belts and swords hanging from baldrics studded with jewellery. They also carried in their hand maces and war axes. Tarbazin bearers were also present during the reception of foreign embassies. For example, during the visit of a Byzantine embassy to the Abbasid court in 917, the Byzantine envoys, while waiting to be received by the Caliph al-Muqtadir, were attended by Gilman and servants carrying Tarbazins. When the envoys were granted audience and made their half-day journey on foot within the palatial compound, they passed 13 palaces before reaching their destination. Passing by thousands of Hujaria, Gilman and servants standing in rows on foot, carrying armuds and Tarbazins. As these Tarbazins were real weapons like those of the Leyda Mamluk Tabadiriya, the decoration was largely limited to the hafs, which were often adorned with golden sleeves. This does not mean purely parade Tarbazin axes did not exist at the time. An idea of what this looked like can be drawn from the description of a Tarbazin scent, among other things, by the Byzantine Emperor Romanos 920-44 to the Caliph Al-Radi Bilar in 937. It had a heavy head of gilded silver encrusted with jewels and pearls, with a gilded half decorated in a similar manner. The second half of the 10th century witnessed a rapid decline in the importance of the Tarbazin. In the 11th century, references to its use become scarce. Even the Fatimids, who enthusiastically copied Abbasid styles of weaponry and military equipment, apparently never adopted it, even ceremonially. This indicates that at the time of the Fatimid conquest of Egypt in 969, the military forces of the previous regime, which were mainly composed of ill-equipped Gilman troops, were not using the Tarbazin. It also shows that the axe in other Arab areas was either non-existent or marginal. By the 12th century, the term had become obsolete with the exception of two dictionaries where paradoxically it was included for the first time. The first is an Arabic Persian dictionary of al Maidani, 1124-5, entitled Al-Sami Dil i Asami. Here he makes a term the equivalent to the Arabic term Miwal, meaning pickaxe, implying the loss of meaning of war axe in both Arabic and Persian. This is supported further by the fact no alternative word for war axe is used in his work. The second is by Baghdadi linguist and philologist Abu Mansur al-Jawaliki, 1145, who wrote the famous Dictionary of Arabicized Foreign Terms. Not only does he mention the term, but also defines it. In short, he defines it as a saddle axe, the Persian equivalent being Fas al sarj because Persian horsemen carry it in the saddle to fight with it. The definition would be uncritically accepted, however this definition is not correct. Indeed, this is mistranslated and actually means war axe or battle axe. This was the last time the term Tarbazin is used in Arabic sources. Al-Tasusi uses the term Nachach, 
to designate a war axe and he seemed to be the only Arab author to use it. He describes this as having a half moon head 25 centimeters long and about 15 centimeters across. However, this word did not take root in the Arab region, and from the second half of the 12th century onwards, the war axe was simply referred to as tabar, meaning axe. Fadlala al-Umari, 1349, uses the term tarbazin in his work Al-Tarif bil i Mustala al-Sharif, despite the term being obsolete. However, in this context, zin means saddle rather than weapon, as this would be the obvious place where a war axe was attached when being carried by a horseman. This represents a decline of the war axe as a weapon in the second half of the 10th century, with the decline of the term tarbazin accompanying it. This meant that the weapon simply became known by its most generic term when it reappeared in the Mamluk period, tabar. Though in decline, the war axe seems to have re-emerged in the second half of the 12th century, re-emerging on a very limited level as a ceremonial and princely weapon. It never regained the role it had formerly enjoyed as a major close combat weapon during the first Abbasid period. Nevertheless, its resurgence coincided with the resurgence of Abbasid power in Iraq, accompanying the revival and reaffirmation of caliphal institutions under 150 years of desolation and deprivation under Buwayhid and Seljuk rule. Monetary independence with the issuing and striking of gold in Baghdad in the name of the Caliph, the building and strengthening of the Caliphal army, the restoration and confirmation of court rules and ceremony, and the reintroduction of the royal hunt marked the beginning of this new era. A golden period, both figuratively and literally, was inaugurated by the Caliphate of Al Muqtafi. 1136 to 60, who is described by Ibn al Athir as the first Abbasid caliph to have gained independence in Iraq since the advent of the Buwayhids. This period of revival would last until the Mongol invasion in the 13th century. This would strongly argue that the Tarbazin had been reintroduced by the Abbasid caliphs as part of their effort to reinstate court rules and traditions. Upholding religious and temporal symbols of sovereignty and ensigns of royalty to ensure the survival of their institution in a world which they could no longer control by military might was, indeed, the policy of the last seven Abbasid Caliphs of Baghdad. The fact that the war axe in its above described role was nowhere as conspicuous as in the Mamluk Sultanate, which was the most notable inheritor and perpetrator of Abbasid institutions and traditions, itself contains a convincing argument for the Abbasid origin of the later war axe. References to the Tarbazin in the 9th and 1st half of the 10th century show that the weapon was deadly and effective against armoured foes, implying the axe had a heavy and large blade. This placed it in the middle between the light dabbles and heavy armoured. This changed in the second half of the 10th century with the emergence of the lat, in essence a heavy dabbles, which became the principal cavalry weapon, taking over the role of the armud and tarbazin. Therefore the weapon had almost completely disappeared as a regular cavalry weapon by that century. The logistical, economic and political aspect also played a key role in the tarbazin's decline. Although less costly than an armud, it was still an expensive weapon reserved for the elite. To be effective against armour, it needed a heavy blade of high quality steel, since iron and bronze did not take an edge well, additionally requiring solid reconstruction and regular maintenance. Furthermore, the half was often made of iron to endure stress when the blade struck armour. Its use in the Abbasid Caliphate reflected the zenth of prosperity and power of the empire. The decline and disintegration of Abbasid power, coinciding with the emergence of less costly but effective weapons, such as the Lat, declined Tarbazin usage as it did with the Armud. In the Mamluk period, the term Tabar was used for all types of war axes, whether long or short hafted, with large or small, light or heavy, asymmetrical bearded or crescent shaped blades, and whether on foot or on horseback. Generally, the typical Mamluk Tabar had a rather large crescent or asymmetrically shaped blade, about 23 to 31 centimeters long. The haft varied in size according to whether it would be used on foot or mounted. One Mamluk Furusiya treatise described the Tabar suitable for a horseman as having a fairly large bearded blade and a haft which was not very long. 
A miniature from another Fordusia treatise also shows a Mamluk horseman brandishing a tabar with a crescent shaped blade. However, fighting on horseback with a tabar was not part of regular Mamluk training and formations in the Tibak military school. In fact, rank and file Muslims, Harka troopers, and even low ranking emirs were not entitled to carry such weapons, being reserved for sultans and high ranking emirs. The Tabar Deria, the Tabar bearers, who originated from the Abbasid Tarbazim bearers, were a small unit of Mamluk elite troops selected from the royal Mamluks as bodyguards and escorts for the Sultan. They were commanded by a low ranking emir called Amir Tabar. The Tabaras they carried were not designed merely for show and parade purposes, but were real war axes, the same as those used on horseback. The unit carried their tabaras attached to their saddles when they accompanied the Sultan on his travels and military expeditions. What's interesting to note is the rise of the Abbasid war axe coincides with the rise of the Dane axe as a weapon in early medieval Scandinavia and with the Vikings, testifying to trade and contact between medieval Scandinavia and the Islamic world. Is it possible that the emergence of two-handed axes in this period has cause? What can the two-handed axe from the Abbasid and Mamluk world also tell us about the role of the Dane axe in the Viking world? Before this is said, it's important to distinguish both types. The Abbasid and Mamluk axes were large, heavy and thick, designed as an anti-armor weapon. The Dane axe on the other hand, as far as I'm aware, is only limited to its iconic shape and the blades are quite thin. Is there an explanation for this difference? I think the answer lies in the fact that though both axes were different, thematically they filled a similar role as anti-armour weapons, with the Scandinavian world being of lighter armour, the most protected being mail, a helmet and a shield. Research done by reconstructionists such as Roland Warschecker show that Viking shields were not that thick, consisting of planks of wood glued together and edged with rawhide. Such an axe would not need to be particularly thick or heavy to go through such a shield or male armour, making it both an anti-armour weapon and also a cleaver for lightly armoured opponents. This would explain their use by elite units such as the Haskals and Varangian Guard in being effective damage dealers to what would be expected to be medium armoured foes. For armoured foes such as fully armoured cavalrymen, armoured from head to toe, the Abbasid and Mamluk axes would serve a more optimum role, which makes sense within the medieval Islamic world.